God, I do thank you for your word, and I thank you for the time that you've given us, Lord, that we spend life sometimes and think that it's always just going to be here, and it's always just going to keep, there's going to be more. By the way, none of us have ever died before, so we think that it's never going to happen either. And God, then we realize is that we look the world around us, people that we love, people that weren't intending to die, die, people move on, death of relationships, death of physical life. And God, I pray that we would live this life grabbing it with both hands, thankful and grateful, not making the decisions of life based upon conventionalities, uh, ease, desire, but your spirit directing us and leading us. And I pray, God, that you'd give us your word here tonight that would lead us in an understanding of what that looks like and how it looks. And God, because I'm a man and because I'm tired and because it's a day after Christmas, my body is weak and my mind is weak. And I thank you so much for bringing these people here tonight. But recognizing that weakness, not because, and admitting it, not because I intend for the study to be weak, but admitting it so that when you speak powerfully by your spirit, men would know that you, in fact, are God. So God, take your glory. I pray that you'd stir these minds, stir the hearts, and I pray that you'd lead us in your way triumphant. We pray for this grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our previous studies, we saw that essentially there was two men that were introduced to us. One was Nimrod and one was Abram. Nimrod was the man that tried to make a name unto himself. He could build things with his hands, do things for the renown amongst men. He was a man that in some way or another was a religious man. He built a tower, as it says, unto the heavens. And everything about him would give the impression that there was some sort of religion in him. He was a mighty hunter, the scripture says, before the Lord. He was a man who was renowned upon the earth, who made great things. And it was at his city, the city of Babel, that it says, let us make a name for ourselves. And that city Babel had the name, the gateway of God, the place and the promise that this religious system he was establishing was giving the promise that you're going to bring people into the presence of God. But as you follow Babel, started by Nimrod, this man of no faith, although he thought he was a man of faith, the man who only saw things, but faith is for those people that don't see. This man who was religious in nature, but wasn't godly, building a thing upon the earth that he could see and bring glory unto himself, this man who promised Babel, the gateway unto God, ended, as we saw, with another understanding in chapter 11 and verse 9. It says that the name was changed and Babel no longer meant a gateway to God, but Babel now meant confusion. And what we saw is that that becomes a picture of man upon the earth. Man who approaches a system of religion that promises to be greatness because by all means, look at all the people involved. All the world was gathered around it. Those who make a religion that's about them preserving themselves, come let us build a city and a tower unto the heavens. Let's preserve ourselves in the name of God. It's unto the heavens. Let's make sure that we can never be dispersed. Look at all the people we can congregate around us. And this becomes evidence in and of itself that we're the people of God. But this religion that started like that ends up in a place of causing confusion, and as opposed to being, bringing unity, it actually causes disunity. It causes a breaking apart of the world. But in contradistinction to him was another man by the name of Abram, and that's why the text introduces us in chapter 11, at the end of 11, to this man, Abram. Later on, his name was changed to Abraham. We'll get to that when we get to it. But what we found with this Abraham, he actually isn't trying to establish a great city upon the earth. He's actually leaving the greatest city upon the earth. It was the Ur of the Chaldees that they invented things like this, the, bat the bathtub. And you may say, well, you invented a bathtub, whoop de doo And all I would say is, have you ever taken a bath in a river before? Not very fun. Or have you ever taken a bath in stale water, a pond? Not very clean, pretty disgusting actually. And so what we find is that Abram comes from the sophisticated city, the Ur of the Chaldees, the Ur of the Chaldees that people and archaeologists, which is a fairly recent science, said that the Ur of the Chaldees never existed until they found it. And what they found in the Ur of the Chaldees was a calculus equation that was so complicated the scholars at Oxford and Cambridge still couldn't understand the complexity of the calculus they were dealing with in that day. Ur of the Chaldees has since been discovered, and it's very much a city, and Abram came from the Ur of the Chaldees. He left all of that place of reputation, of things you can see, of things that you can grab onto, of the opportunities of working the society and making yourself great. He goes to the place not out of stupidity, not out of a dream of his own mind. Well, I'm just going to try something new. 
He goes to the new place because of one thing that happened is God says, leave. And when God says leave and we choose to cleave, we'll find ourselves in pain. God says, leave and go to the city, go to the place. I'll show you what it's like. And he didn't have any evidences of it. He couldn't Google it on Google Earth and see what it looked like. He couldn't look at the 501, uh, uh, 401k options that are available to him. He didn't have any promise, no photos, no travel agent that would actually promise a safe journey. God says, go, and so he went. And he went, he was sent, he went, and then he put to put it in the words of Major Ian Thomas in the context of Elijah, of course. So God, I'm sending, I'm sending you. He went, sent, went, and now stay put. And that's what we see here tonight. So the contradistinction in the passage so far was this man who was a man of sight but thought he was a man of faith who was about building a kingdom unto himself that promised to bring people into the presence of God but ultimately brought confusion. And then you see this man, Abram, that left the greatness of man and entered in by faith to no promise, no guarantee other than this, faith, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And he leaves the context of comfort, of ease, of reputation, of congregation, of multitudes of powers and strengths of men, and he goes to the place where God literally would be his only strength. And so that's what we see of faith. We see faith becomes a test of the truthfulness of whether or not a man is really willing to live his life in accordance with the call of God. And he didn't dream up the call of God, but when God's word came, he obeyed. But amongst the men that left now, we're talking about the false religion versus the true. We're talking about Nimrod versus Abram. We're talking about Babylon versus Jerusalem. These themes are carried through the entirety of the scripture so that in Revelation 17, we see that there's mystery Babylon the great, the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. And the similarities are striking if you'll take the time to look at it. But now that we're talking not about the, the contrast between Babylon and Jerusalem or Nimrod and Abram or the man of sight versus the man of faith, but now we're looking at two groups of people that were actually followers of of faith. And amongst them was a man by the name of, you guessed it, Abram. But it tells us in chapter 13, his nephew, his nephew is Lot, Abram and Lot. And what we're going to see in this is here's now the distinction, the demarcation between a truly godly man, a godly believer, and Lot, who is a worldly believer. And there's many people like this. They think they know God, and indeed they do, but they don't walk with him. I don't like the word uh, carnal believer because it has some wrong connotations behind it but what i see with lot is a worldly believer and so we found in our previous study that there came a time in abram's obedience that god had called him to go to the land of canaan and indeed he went but as soon as he goes into the context of canaan we find there's a famine that arose upon the land and what do we find in this the principle that obedience unto god is not the cessation of difficulties Obedience unto God brings with it an accompaniment of all sorts of trials and pains and tests that we have to go through. And if we're not going to be men or women that are going to be willing to confront those trials in the context of what God told us to do and rejecting the conveniences of the preservation of our own flesh in order to walk in the obediences of that repentance, essentially, of our flesh, we'll find ourselves making the same mistake that Abram meant, even though God called him to go to, the earth, go to the land of Canaan, he flees the very moment he faces a difficulty. And how many people do this? As soon as God tells us to do something, to go somewhere, to do something, then all of a sudden, there's a reasonable alternative to faith, once again, to borrow the words of Major Ian Thomas. Where there's a reason it out. And the danger is that we say, well, I know God told me to do this, but circumstances dictate differently. And let me tell you the truth. When you're trying to decide what God would have you to do, if what you're thinking God might call you to do will violate what you know God did tell you to do, don't do it. Sent, went, put. That's God's plan. Sent, went, and left. That's what Abram did. And so God will put us in context in obedience to him where the difficulty comes. There was a severe famine within the land and he thinks to himself and endangers his wife 
and endangers the people with him. But not only did he expose her to all sorts of potential shame and being violated by this Pharaoh, as it tells us in the passage itself, what we also find within the passage is that there's the propensity to inject into his nephew Lot desires that are unholy. And what do we mean? What were the desires that came into Lot? It tells us in the passage, we saw this in our previous study, that he took Lot with him. When Abram walked in disobedience, he went to Egypt, a type of the world. He runs back into the world in order to find his security and not continuing to walk in faith with the Lord. He runs back to the world, but then he also does something else. He takes Lot with him, and when Lot comes with him, Lot is infected by the lust of the world. Lot is infected by the lust of Egypt. And what that tells me is that us men, we may think we're strong enough. We're probably not. But we may be strong enough like Abram. We've weakened in the faith. We made a compromise. And it may not affect us at all. God will rebuke us. We'll turn around and never turn to that sin again. Great. Here's the problem. There's a weaker brother with you. There's a lot of weaker brethren around you. And those lot of weaker brethren around you are going to be affected by what you've done. If for nothing else, then our own children will begin to look at the the opportunities that we've had freedom in. The freedom was ultimately to disobey what God tells us to do. But our kids are the ones that begin to imitate the behavior. And that's what we saw with Lot. Lot, as soon as in chapter 13, as soon as Abram comes back out of the land of Egypt, type of the world, with his nephew Lot, the first thing that happens is the money that Abram gained as a consequence of his going back into the world becomes the point of division with his nephew Lot as soon as they do come back into the promised land. And now they're fighting with one another, as we saw. They're fighting with one another. And what's the basis of their conflict? Over their herds. You say, well, we don't have herds today. The herds, the goat, the sheep, the donkeys, these were all forms of wealth in the ancient world. And the very thing they gain by going back into the world becomes the point of conflict when they do come back into obedience before the Lord. And they're fighting over possessions. They're fighting. They're saying, look, we've become so great. We need to separate. And indeed, they did need to separate. Only Abraham, being the godly man that he is and was at this time, Abram looks at him and says, look, don't let there be strife between us. Here's this picture again. Put it in your mind. It's not the the distinction between the false religion and the true religion. This is now the distinction between the godly man who's a believer and the worldly man who, in fact, is a believer. And I know Lot was a believer because it tells us in the book of Peter, righteous Lot. He was righteous. And now you see this distinction between these two groups of men. And the one man had every right to fight over the money. The other man had no right. And the man who took no rights unto himself, God still provided and filled in the gap. The man that fought over his rights was the man that lost everything. And if it wasn't for the righteous man, he would have continually lost everything. And so here we see this distinction. Abram looks at him, he says, look, don't let there be any strife between us. Separate ourselves. Let's not fight. You take the land that you want. And Abram was already promised by the Lord everything that you see. All the Jordan Valley was his. It was essentially as good as done. God said it, east, west, north, south. As far as your eye can see, wherever your foot would trot, it's yours, Abram. What does Abram do? He says, Lot, look, let's not fight. You pick. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. He defers his rights and allows Lot, the weaker brother, to make the choice. Lot was the fool for making the choice. Lot should have been wiser and said, you know what? Here you're an older brother. You're a more mature brother in the Lord. We could contemporize it. I tell you what, you make the choice. Let me submit to your authority. We could say Father Abraham. But he wanted to be the master. Lot was a young man, and so often the stumbling block of young men is that they think, (laughs) unfortunately, they think they got what it takes. I told you on Sunday when I was 20 years old, I I was so confident in myself. And when I was 20 years old, I I, I looked at the world and I said, I don't give a rip what the world thinks. And then when I hit 40 years old, a couple few years ago here, 
When I hit 40 years ago, 40 years old, I realized the world wasn't thinking about me at all. <laughs> A little perspective, <laughs> time adds to things. And we thought that we were so important, so wise, so significant. But the problem is, is it tells us here that Lot, verse 10, that's where we pick up, Lot lifted up his eyes. And he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of, of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. And this was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the second phrase we'll see here, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus, they separated from each other. So what do we find? Here's this young Lot that was led down to Egypt through Abraham's unbelief, and the basis of him making choices now for himself was the world. The basis of which direction he's now going to turn, left or right, is does it look like Egypt or not? Because in Egypt, something was added to me that made me feel very good. It appealed to my flesh. It looked like the Garden of Eden. Egypt had an abundance. It was verdant. It was beautiful. And there is Sodom and Gomorrah. And this was before God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. It tells us in chapter 14, later on in 15 actually, that the whole land was filled with bitumen and tar pits. And what that tells us is that when the judgment came, fire and brimstone coming from the heavens, some type of uh, uh, comets or asteroids or something sparked from the sky, burning sulfur, it burned up that entire region. And that's why if you go there today, you, you actually you can still taste the salt in the soil. If you go off the, the, the path and just, you know, right there at the Dead Sea, you can go out there and grab some of the soil and put it in your mouth and it tastes like salt everywhere. It's, it's, it's been judged in some way or another. But it wasn't this way at this time. Lot lifted up his eyes. He looks and sees how he can advantage himself. The basis of his decision is what kind of lust can it gratify inside of me? And he makes his decision accordingly. And Many, many foolish worldly believers. What makes them a worldly believer? They make the decision based upon sensual wisdom. And if you're a person that makes decisions based upon sensual wisdom, you'll obey God as long as it doesn't cost you anything, but you'll disobey him the very minute it does. And a worldly believer is that one who is easily led by the devil and not by the spirit of God. Why? Because the devil, according to James chapter 3, is in sensual wisdom. What is sensual wisdom? Taste, touch, see, smell, and hear. The devil manipulates because he cannot rule over and come inside of a Christian Therefore, what happens is he sensually stimulates the Christian and tricks him to live according to his flesh. What you taste, touch, see, smell, and hear, you're sensual. And as a man begins to be led by these things, James says the fruit of it is going to be bitterness and strife and contentions. What do we see with Lot? Inside of him was sensual wisdom. He looks around. What was going on? He was having bitter fights with the very man that could have saved him and could have blessed him. And so he finds himself separating himself, lifting up his eyes and making decisions based upon what merely his gratification of the sensual nature would be and not by the voice of God. And it tells us in Romans chapter 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are truly the sons of God. The demarcation of a Christian man or woman ought to be the fact that they listen to the voice of God and then once listening to it, obey it. And I can't tell you how many people that listen to the voice of God they hear the call of God, and then once God tells them to do something, when they count the cost, they disobey. And they misunderstand that passage by Jesus when he says, count the cost. They think Jesus is saying, count the cost, and if it's too high, don't do it. He's not saying that at all. He's not saying, men, women, you have an option to obey me or not. We do have the option to obey him. He will never violate our will. He'll never make us do something we don't want to do. God doesn't do that. God could. He doesn't do that. And when he says to us, count the cost, why does he do this? Wisdom understands this. He does it because in the midst of conflict, when everything is difficult, I won't give up in the middle of the conflict. If I count the cost, so many people want to get married, let's say, and the reason they want to get married is because of all the accruement of benefits that can come into their lives, and they start counting them up, whether it's on the physical or the emotional level, they want to get married for one of these two reasons. But they don't stop and say, well, let me count the cost. Is God really telling me to get married to this person? Is he telling me to enter into a relationship with them? Let me tell you the truth, friend. 
if you do something that God has not called you to do, God will let you do it. He, he won't violate, he won't, yo, yeah, you will not marry them. He'll let you do it. He doesn't violate your person. God doesn't, Satan does that. Satan violates your person. God doesn't. But what happens is when you exercise your choice apart from him, you find yourself carried away with the pagan kings and the pagan system. Keto Leomar, you find yourself doing things and being with people that you never thought you would have and hating your life. Praise God for a righteous man like Abram that rescued him. But what we find is that many people make the basis and the decision points. I'm going to marry this person or not. I'm going to take this job or not take that job. What's the decision point? The decision point for people is, will it add something to me? Will, it, will I accrue lots of money in it? I'm looking at Egypt. I'm looking at the world. Is that going to advantage me? I will look at this person over there. Is she going to advantage me? Is he going to advantage me? You place those kind of expectations on another person, you'll end up hating them. The very people that you think are going to satisfy you are the people you're going to hate with all your guts. Why? Because you placed an expectation upon them that they, as mere people, could never satisfy. And when they fail you, oh, yeah. But when you go in and say, God, you've, you need to be the one that satisfies these needs in my heart. You need to be the one that's going to touch these issues in me. When you enter into a relationship like that, you count the cost not because you're saying, I can bail if I don't want to. It's because once I enter into the relationship, I can't bail. And I'll stick to it. And I commit myself to it. But what becomes the power of that keeping force in that relationship is the decision to not derive my sense of identity from them. Not to look at them as ones who are going to gratify this deep need. People do satisfy us. They, they, they give a level of love and comfort, and there is. But I'm talking to the level of the soul. And when we place those expectations on another person, a finite person, to satisfy an infinite need, you will only be frustrated at their lack of ability to satisfy that need, and that relationship will end. It doesn't take two to tango. Sometimes people think, oh, it takes two to tango. Two people have to be fighting to break up. No, it doesn't. All, one, all you need is one person to say, you gratify me, and if you stop gratifying me, I'm out of here. I'll find someone else. That's all it takes. So Lot was a worldly believer, and he made his decisions based upon sight. What he could see, what he could get. Egypt, the world, has been injected into him, and then he does the foolish thing he chose for himself, verse 11. And what I find in that is also instructive because what is the basis, again, of us making the decisions? God, do you want this in my life? And why do we do that? Is it because we're pathetic and, yeah, well, God gave us brains. Yeah, he did give us brains, but are, is your brain infinite? Do you know the beginning from the end? Do you know what's going to happen by Keto Leomar and how he's going to attack the region that you think you should go to? See, Lot says, ooh, I want to go into Sodom and Gomorrah. So he goes sensual wisdom but you being led by your sensual wisdom puts you in a place where you're going to be destroyed by keto leomar the wicked kings the heathen kings and they came and destroyed you could be a very intelligent person do you know the beginning from the end do you know who god is in that way you see we live according to thy word is a lamp unto my feet what written letters on a page no the the letter kills, the spirit gives life. It's the spirit of God that quickens those words and says, Ben, this is for you. The active word that says, now turn left here and turn to the right. As Isaiah said, if you do stray a little to the left and your heart is right towards the Lord, you'll hear a voice from behind you say, Oi, you're getting off to the left. Get back over to the right. And if you do stray to the right, you'll hear a voice behind you, not in front of you. We want him to be in front of us. He says, no, I'll stand behind you. Thank you. And he allows us to make a little bit of errors. And as we start going off, we'll hear a voice from behind us say, Oi, get back over, and we'll get back over. And so the Christian life is a series of making mistakes and getting off path and being corrected by the Lord. And if we're not a person that's willing to be corrected, we'll never grow. We'll find ourselves going off, and you'll hear the oi, but you'll keep going off to your own destruction. And I have to believe that God had begun to give Lot a whole lot of ois. <laughs> But Lot didn't listen. He chooses for himself. He lifts his eyes and looks at Egypt and says, look, that's Egypt. I mean, I'm in the promised land. I'm in, I'm in the Lord. But the basis of my choosing what the Lord wants me to do 
is Egypt? How can it gratify me? How can it satisfy me? And Abram never did this. He left everything to obey God. Lot only obeys God now on the level when it advantages him. But when a group of people do what God tells them to do, not because they're getting any advantage, but because they, they want to be used upon planet Earth, then you see something glorious. You see, that's why I, I started here this evening in some way or another, maybe before we prayed, or while we prayed perhaps it was, is the whole issue I recognize I'm going to die. And I want to waste my whole life living for myself, choosing for myself, looking at my eyes and figuring out what I can get for myself, and at the end of it saying it was all wasted. Yes, I'll, quote, go to heaven, but Paul said in Corinthians chapter 3 that it's all going to be burnt up like smoke. And there's, where's Ben? I, I smell mesquite. I smell Ben. Or if you were to put it, he said you're going to escape, but through the flames of the fire, everything's going to be burned off. Wood, hay, and stubble, all of those things we try to preserve on earth is destroyed in a moment. He spent 80 years building this. Boom, in a moment. Gone. And I think about myself, if, if Paul rightly says, and indeed he does, that all the works are going to be tried through fire, wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burnt up through the fire, but gold and precious stones will not. Let me ask you a question. If we're going to build a church out of wood, hay, and stubble, how big could the church be? A building, I'm talking about. We could build a massive building. If, if we said, well, what's your building instruments? Hay bells. Okay, there you go. How big of a hay bell building could we build with $100,000? pretty massive how about a million dollars it'll be huge hay bale buildings and if you're into hay bale buildings i'm not dogging hay bale buildings i'm using it as a picture so go with it here okay <laughs> hey, we are in north idaho <laughs> but how big of a building could you build if you only built it out of precious stones gold tiny probably put it on your shelf put it in your display case you say well there's there's the building i built and so what we do is we get stimulated. We say, wow, look at that. It's such a massive building. Sensual wisdom. But God doesn't look at it like that. He looks at it and he says that quality of craftsmanship and put together, it was built upon me. That's gold. And the very thing that, we're, thing that we think we're going to lose by entering into covenant with him and faithful obedience to him is the very thing we gain when? Now? No, in eternity when we stand before him. So it always comes up when men say, well, I don't really believe that. Our actions do speak louder than words. And when we say no to God, and he said, walk with me, Lot. Walk with me, Abraham. When we say no to him for some sensual pleasure, I lift up my eyes, choose for myself, we forsake the grace that could have been ours. A lot of people think that, well, this is how I determine God's will. If I can, you think about Jonah. And Jonah could probably say, well, if God doesn't want me to go to Tarshish, then I won't have money to buy to go to Tarshish. Jonah had money to buy a ticket to go to Tarshish. Is that the basis of him deciding, God, if you don't want me to do this, help the ticket guy not to be there. And he shows up, the ticket guy's there, he's got money in his pocket, he pays the fare and goes to Tarshish. Is that the basis of your decisions? Oh, God. You ever do this when you're a kid? I remember being 17 year old, uh, years old and crumpling up a piece of paper and saying, God, if you want me to ask her out on a date, let it go into the trash can without hitting the rim. It'll be a perfect swish. And I'm like, oh, God, two out of three. <laughs> oh, God, what I meant to say is if you do want me to go out with her, let it hit the rim. And you throw it, and it swishes. And you're like, what I meant? Oh, wait, I said that wrong. That was me. What it really was was you saying it, and I just made the people hear what they want to hear. And I find that the sensual wisdom doesn't make me a non-believer, although it can lead to very troubling places. It will certainly lead us to vulnerability. The very thing we're trying to preserve our life is the very thing we're going to lose our life when we follow sensual wisdom. But look at Abram, it says in verse 12. It says, Abram settled in the land of Canaan. Where did God call him to go? Canaan. While Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, what did God see in all of this? God doesn't see the way things men see. In the Gospel of Luke, it says the things that are highly valued in the eyes of men are detestable in the eyes of God. What was it, Luke 15, I think it was? Forgive me, I don't have it offhand. The things that are highly valued in the eyes of men are detestable in the eyes of God. 
And what it tells us here is that God's opinion about the place was that the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Was this Lot's opinion of the people in Sodom? Did he look at it and say, oh, those people are wicked, they're detestable? No, Lot looked at him, and because he had opened his heart to sensual wisdom, was now judging the wickedness of men by his own heart, which led him to a, an easement, a, a comfortability with the wickedness of men. And it reminds me earlier in the book of Genesis that it tells us during the times of Noah. It tells us in chapter 6 and verse 4, the mighty men were upon the earth, men of renown, the men of old, the greatness of man was upon the earth. That's what man thought about man. But it says in verse 5 of chapter 6, but the Lord saw the wickedness of men was great upon the earth, and every intention of his thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So God's opinion of things are not the same way men see things. It's not because he's mean, it's because he's true. It's not because he's a jerk, it's because he understands everything. He doesn't judge upon the outward appearance of a thing, he looks at the heart. And how many of us, if we were to put it in physical terms, have met a person that outwardly looks very beautiful and attractive, but inwardly they're evil and cruel. Do you find that out the very first time you see them? You, you go up to Mr. Wright or Mr. Mrs. Handsome or whatever, and you look up to him and say, like, hey, foxy lady. You know, that's what you're thinking in your mind, and you're thinking there could be no wrong with this person. Why? Because their outward man looks so attractive. And then what happens over time? You realize the outward man is all that's there. Really? That's all it is, is we get into this little relationship where he gets to take liberties with me and I get to kind of sit there and pretend I like it, you know. And, uh, but don't worry, he loves me. If the man loves you, he doesn't do that to you. <laughs> and we sit back and we think, oh, this is the key to relationship. This is the key to marriage, to life, to job and whatever. Sensual, sensual. Appease the sensual man. And then you look at the outward man, you think he's cute, he's handsome, or he's funny, or all these types of things. And then you find out it leaves you dead, dry, and feel used. Truly, Jesus was right when he says, if you seek your life, you're going to lose it. That's a fact. That's a law. If you lose your life for my sake, okay, God, I'm all in with you. You'll find it. And the very thing you hunger for is the very thing God will give you. Abram had to give up the very thing that God gave him. God gave him all of Canaan, and he had to give it up in order to be at peace with Lot. Okay, Lot, you can have some of Canaan. You can have it. Go ahead, take the best of Canaan. I don't care. I'm a man of God. And if it's truly from God, it'll come back to you. What does God do here? He says, Abram, I'm giving it all to you. And if it's truly of God, you can give it up. You can lose it. And how many of us have felt like we've lost the thing that God has given us? Because somebody like Lot, who's a carnal, worldly believer, stole it away from us. You keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't choose for yourself. Don't make decisions upon with your eyes. You settle in the land of Canaan. Just rest in him, the spirit-filled life as we saw. Walk with him. And if you do this, then God will restore what the locusts have devoured. But God will not restore what locusts have devoured if you continue and model the behavior of worldly Christians. The temptation for a godly man is to say, well, look at these worldly Christians. They're going after the world, and they seem to be prospering. Let me say this, first season. And the temptation is to go, oh, I'm going to compromise. The temptation in churches is to compromise, to say, look, if we walk in the flesh and do the things of the world, it works, and everybody comes to the church, and they show up, and we're like, rah, 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 it works. But who said it's producing the fruit that God desires? Are we making our decisions of whether or not God is moving in a place based upon sensual wisdom, what we see? Or spiritual wisdom, because the consequence of us being here is we're becoming more like Jesus. Are people being converted in the sense they just intellectually sent that God exists and they want to go to heaven when they die? Who doesn't? Hindus do. Show me a person that wants to go to hell. Is that the evidence? Well, I'll go to heaven. Or is the proof that God is there is souls are being changed, not pretense of learning, memorizing Bible verses. Nothing wrong with memorizing Bible verses. But if that's the sum effect of our Christianity, boy, I tell you, I've been there and done that, and that is death to me, death. I've memorized more Bible verses than anyone you know. I know the Bible. I love the Bible. And it's necessary. It's prerequisite. But if that's all it is, it's death. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures and you think that by that you have eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify of me. It's Jesus that's the important. So is this thing really just creating a show and having people raise their hands and say, look at all the people are saved. How do you know? 
How do you know they're saved? Because they said so. Or is it a spiritual thing where you go beyond the eyes and you see the hearts of men and women are conformed to the image of Christ? See, Lot was a worldly believer, and it worked for a season. And Abram didn't have any evidence. He gives up his rights. He just dwells in the spirit life in the land of Canaan. He gives up what was his rights. And God gave him back what he had lost. And if you're a man like that, a woman like that, God will always give back. Don't start thinking to yourself, well, I lost this thing that God has given me because of some wicked man like Lot, a worldly Christian. Don't do that. Because God comes to him, it says in verse 14, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. What does God do? He says, first of all, I will give it to you. What was Lot doing? Lot chose for himself. What was Abram doing? Abram let God choose for him. God, you choose. I will do it. Lot used his will to advantage himself, but Abram had God's will. Lot lifted up his eyes, but Abram, the man of faith, only lifted up his eyes when God told him to. Abram wasn't walking around looking up his eyes going, oh, what can I advantage myself by? What can I do? Where's my opportunities? Abram abided in Jesus. Abram rested in the Lord. Abram was restfully available for God's service. God, I'm in the land of Canaan. I'm settling there. I'm fine. Abram wasn't running around the land of Canaan just getting busy and doing stuff and doing tap dance shows. Well, God told me to be here, so that's all I'm going to do is be here. And when you're restfully available for God, not a busybody doing stuff God didn't tell you to do, but restfully available, chill out, relax. And then God says, now I want you to do this. Do it. That's simple. So here's Abram resting. And God comes to him and says something to him. And he says, now, Abram, you lift up your eyes. Lot didn't inquire of the Lord. Lot didn't pray unto the Lord. He just used his sensual wisdom and says, what will advantage me? And if it happens to advantage me, I'll do it. Makes me feel good, I'll do it. But if it doesn't make me feel good or doesn't advantage me, I won't do it. A worldly believer, a worldly man using the flesh to dictate what God would have him to do. But Abram, resting in the Lord, resting in Canaan, and God coming to him, and in God's timing, God says, now, this is the moment you lift up your eyes now. And I praise God that he has us lift up our eyes because I can look down. <laughs> I can look down. God says, lift up. Don't get depressed. Don't get depressed. Don't look at yourself and see what has been taken from you. Don't get bitter at other people because they've taken something from you. Don't look around you in the sense that you're seeing the circumstances around you and they're freaking you out. Lift your eyes up to him whose throne is in the heavens as the maid looks to the hands of the master, as the the bond slave looks to the hands of the master. Lift our eyes up to you, Lord, for we've endured much contempt and much ridicule from the proud. God, we lift our eyes to you and wait for you as the great master in the great king's hall to just twitch his finger, and we'll know what that means because we're your servants. And when you twitch your finger, we'll do what you say. But if you don't twitch your finger and tell us to do something, we'll just stand at attention and chill out. We're going to relax. We're going to wait, but our eyes are going to be on you, Abram. Now, lift up your eyes. Right now, Abram. And everything that Lot has now taken and chose for himself, I will, he says, verse 15. This is something I'm going to do for you. And so we find this great promise because of Abram walking in faith. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Can you count the dust of the earth? No. Is he saying that there's going to be as many offspring of Abraham as there is dust on the earth? No. He's making a type that you can't count the dust of the earth. You can't count the stars in the heaven, as he says later. So it is that you cannot count the dust of the earth. Men used to think they could count the stars in heaven, and they'd say, aha, we can count the stars. We're smarter than God. And then you realize those are just the ones you can see. As the guys were showing me out of the property, Glue Creek, the other day, they said, see some of these stars out here, like this one over here and such and such? That's not a star. That's an entire galaxy. Huh? You're kidding. And then you realize you can't even count the stars. 
You can't. We don't have enough numbers, and yet our star is this little tiny star, the sun, and we think it's so big. It is big, but nothing compared to the rest. And then you realize there's a big God, and he says, look, you can't count the stars. You can't count the sands of the sea. You won't be able to count your descendants. Can any man count his descendants after Abram? There's literally millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And you say, well, I can get a computer. Then your computer counted it. You can't. No man can count these things. You, you ever try to do that? 104,693, 104,694, 104,695, 104,696. Oh, boy, this is hurting. You ever try it? Try it. Try it. I, I didn't even get to 1,000. Try it. You can't even count them, Abram. And I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to lay this out. I'm going to bless you. Why? Because you've trusted me. When? When you didn't see ev any evidences for your obedience to me. There's the key. And you know my experience? Is God has taken me so many times through years and years of faithful service with no apparent blessing. No apparent of God's moving. And then right at the point where you're, God knows when you get so low that you can get discouraged and you can fall into sin real easy. I think some of us have been there. You get to that point where you're so discouraged and then God will not let us, if we keep our eyes on him, then the abundance of blessing will come in and he'll say something like this, Ben, I do love you. <laughs> and I've seen everything that you've done. You did it by faith and there's no evidences. You didn't quit when it got hard. I was testing you and I'm, and I'm not only just testing you, but I'm forming you and fashioning you into a new man. And suddenly wisdom and experience begins to show us that God is in control of these things if we'll lift our eyes to him. But if we look at the land of Egypt, if we look at the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, we'll find ourselves living what we think is in the perfect will of God. It'll satisfy our flesh for a season and then it'll bring death and destruction. But if we lift our eyes to him whose throne is in the heavens, God will come to you after periods of times and say, I will do this for you. It's like some young girl will go, well, I just want a man. I want to marry a man. You can marry a man. The, the prettier you are, the faster you can get married. And so you can get a man. But wisdom comes in and says, God, I'm looking at this guy. I'm looking at that guy. It applies to gals, guys too. I'm looking at that gal. I'm looking at that guy. This is what I want. But it's ever dawned on you to say, God, what do you want? Why don't you say that? Because you think, oh, God hates me. No, he doesn't. You think God hates you? Are you going to trust him? Say, God, I, I, I'm going to trust you that you care for me. That's by faith. Life is hard. Life is always hard. Life will always be hard. And you begin to say, God, I'm going to trust you by faith. And some of you girls can watch other girls in the world around you use their bodies to attract boys, and it works, doesn't it? But the marriages don't work. Do what God says to do, and he'll bless your life. He loves you. He cares for you. He's not out to destroy you. Don't think you have to act like the world in order to get God's best. And God comes to him after he sacrifices the ways of the world, the land of Egypt. God comes to him and says, Abram, I imagine Abram was going through depression because when you lose something that you thought God gave you, you get discouraged. And God comes to him like that and says, Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to abundantly provide for you. I'm giving it all. And Abram didn't, didn't see everything that God was going to give him in this moment, but he believed God. And later on in the book of James, he tells us something about the goodness of God and the, the gifts that God gives. He says in James chapter 1, verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow and change. What does James say? Everything good comes from God. And so do you believe this? God, if this is truly from you, then it'll still be there. God, if you truly told me this, then it'll still be there. And if you didn't tell me this, then I don't want it. Praise God, let it be gone. But if you truly gave this to me, praise your name. And if it seems that it's gone, I've lost some of what God has given me, it'll still come back to me. It'll be a test. Will I still look to you by faith? Not seeing, not only am I not seeing my possession of the land, but I'm seeing someone else possess the land that was given to me. So God, I'll trust you, only don't pass me by. Don't pass me by. And I think the worst judgment a Christian can bring upon himself is to allow God to pass him by. And God gives us these moments of trust and obedience, and he says, trust me. 
The Bible also tells, about, tells us about enjoying the things that God has given us. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, at the end of the verse, he says, speaking about God, he says, God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. What is he teaching? Hedonism? Is he teaching uh, uh, the pursuit of pleasure? No. But the things that God gives us, he gives us to enjoy. So if God gives me an ice cream, I'm going to enjoy the ice cream. If he doesn't give me the ice cream, I'm not going to walk around and bitterly judge everyone who has an ice cream. That's the way some Christians are. Hey, you, you get that ice cream. Yeah. I'm sorry. If God allows me to do something wonderful and go to Israel, then I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to say, hey, praise God. He gave me Israel. Hey, thank you, Lord. And if he doesn't, I'm not going to walk around and say, hey, church, you know, all those people get to go and do this fun stuff and not me. Now you've taken your eyes off of God and you put it upon man. But the man of God begins to say, hey, God, you gave me a gift to Israel. And I get to go on this trip. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. God, I've just been keeping my eyes in you and keeping my life faithful to you. And what's the sum effect? Is that God will give us and we can enjoy it. And when God gives you something, you can enjoy it. And I think it's someone like John here. And you sit back and you go, okay, here's a man that's perfectly capable of doing different things. And he says, I just know that God told me to do this. And I think about in this last few months, what has John done? He gets to go to London Spend a few days there. I mean, how much would that have cost? The most expensive city in the world. He went to the Mara Nature Reserve, and the sacrifice was he had to go to Africa. But nonetheless, <laughs> he went to Africa. And you know what? Do you think John wanted to go to Africa? No. But God wanted to take him to a place and say, will you obey me to the uttermost? And there's no way we could have done this. We had, Lord, if you want John to go, then provide the money. Guess what happened? All the money came in. And now, I was talking to him the other day, and he says, look at this. He goes, I live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. I have people would pay tons of money to live here. All my food and bills and everything is taken care of. Downside is, I don't have any spending cash. <laughs> you know, <it's> like <laughs> The good side is, I could never live this wealthily, abundantly, even if I did have a job. And then on top of that, God, when he giveth, guess what I've learned? What the old song says, he giveth, and he giveth, and he giveth again. And so now all of a sudden someone anonymously puts in the tithe box, $1,500 for his airline ticket to go to Israel. And you go, wow, Lord, what did I do to deserve that? You know what it is? Nothing. But because it's all grace, and he, he, he didn't miss the grace because he didn't put his eyes off of God and onto the world. That gift would have been there, if it, but if his eyes were on the world, he wouldn't have been able to receive that gift. And that's what God does. Keep your eyes on me. When it looks like you're losing everything and things are hard, fight through in prayer those times and say, God, I'm going to choose to trust you and praise you. I'm going to choose to honor you. It's a choice. It's a choice that I have to deal with all the time. I'm not going to get discouraged in what I see, and I'm not going to live in the land of Egypt, or my heart is not going to live in Egypt. I'm going to live in Canaan. I'm going to trust you. And God then came to him, and he said in verse 17, so this is what I'll do for you. And then he says, verse 17, arise Walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Let me ask you one question. Did Abram ever possess that land at that moment? No. But it was as good as done. He's saying, I'm going to give this to you. So what did Abram do? Give me the real estate contract and let me see it. Abram didn't do this. He says, okay, God, I trust you. And somewhat 400 and... 70 years later, was it? Finally, we see Joshua entering into the promised land. Okay, God, I trust you. And I'm going to act towards you right now as though it's true that you're God. In other words, my faith is going to have an activity to it. It's going to look like I believe it's as good as done because as I said at the beginning, what Corey Tim Boom actually said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's all that matters. So I'm going to enter in by faith. My heart is discouraged and downcast. Lot is having a lot of fun. I'm not. Oh, God. And he says, Abram, now that I've gotten your family that's going to hinder you out of the way because they don't have faith in me, now I'm going to put your eyes on me. Lift your eyes up. Lift up your eyes. Now look out. That order. Never look out, then look up. Look up and then look out. And I'll tell you what I will give you. Do you believe me, Abram? You know what Abraham said? I believe you. You say, where does it say it? It says it again in verse 17. He walked through the land. His action spoke. 
And Abram, God, God says, Abram, do you believe me? Abram says, yes, I do. So I'll walk through the land. And it says in verse 18, he moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there built an altar. When was the only time that Abraham stopped moving? He walks through the land, north, south, east, and west. This had to have taken months. Land of Israel's not big, but he's walking. And after he walked in obedience to God, then he settled in the, land, in the place of Hebron. And why did he settle? The only reason he stopped was to build an altar. What took place with the altar? It was the place to worship and to praise God. What did Abram do? Romans chapter 5, he tells us, Abraham did not waver in his faith towards God. How? He gave glory to God. What does this mean? We will be tempted to waver. We'll be tempted to give in and to quit, to say, oh, Lord, this is impossible. I can't do it. And right at the point where you're going to throw in the towel is the very point if you keep your eyes on him, he'll rescue you. And Abram was rescued time and again. And the only time he stopped in walking through the land by faith was to worship God, to build himself up. I imagine as he walked through the land and God told him he's going to give this all to him, he's saying, Lord, this is a big chunk of property. How in the world could I possess all this? That's what I think he did. So what does he do? Doubt comes in. I'm sure that happened. And he settled down, began to worship God. He did not waver in his faith, but gave glory to God. He worshiped him. He praised him, but he gave an altar. What was the sacrifice he did? A sin offering? No, it was a burnt offering. We studied this in detail in previous weeks. It was a burnt offering. He was freshly consecrating himself to the Lord. Why? Lord, I look at this project that you have for me. It is so big. It is so vast. I mean, if it was in my flesh, I'd say, sweet, I can do this. I'm going to be master of this place. But then I walked the land and I said, I'm just a man. I'm tired just walking the land. How am I going to have possess this land? I mean, you ever, you, when I lived in Spokane, we had this little tiny city lot, you know, and we had this little tiny grass section, you know, that we'd mow, and it'd take all of like eight minutes to mow. And I thought, boy, I'd love to have land. Then we got this property that has like three quarters of an acre. I can't even mow three quarters of an acre. I'm thinking, imagine, hey, Ben, I'm going to give you, you know, 50 acres of land. I'd be like, sweet. And then I'd say, after walking the land, I'd say, I can't mow all of this lawn. This is ridiculous. And he's not talking about 50 acres. Imagine, he says, you know, 100 square miles. I can't do this. And so he stops at this point. And he goes, Lord, I'm going to build an altar. I'm going to freshly consecrate myself to you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to worship you. And I'm going to praise you. I'm not going to give up. Next week, I thought we were going to get all the way through chapter 14, but somebody talks slow. <laughs> or Lot. <laughs> but we'll find that Lot is carried away by his liberty in Christ and almost destroyed. And when Abram meets him, Abram doesn't come out and say, I told you so. You made your bed. You're going to sleep in it. <laughs> you better learn your lesson, buddy. Abram was quick to jump in. He didn't have convenient excuses and say, you know, I'm kind of tired and I've got a lot of stuff going on. Nope, can't help you a lot. You got, he didn't have any convenient excuses. But in fact, Abram dropped everything and he ran out to risk his life to rescue the weaker brother so that he would be saved from sin and death. God, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and grace that we need to understand these passages, that we would walk in the good of them that we would understand them, not just in the easy to understand historical context of them. The story is very simple to understand. But let us use wisdom and carry these stories into the covenant, the new covenant. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, these things were written to be examples to us, how we are to walk in faith. And so, Lord, I pray that we would see the wisdom of your new covenant in the old. And let us marvel at your greatness. And when we become overwhelmed in our obedience to you, when we've seen the greatness of the promise, our heart joys, but then when we see the weakness of our humanity, our heart faints, let us stop at that point and build an altar to the Lord and not lose heart to build ourselves up in the faith by giving glory to God. Offering our bodies as a living sacrifices, Abram made an altar, 
and offered his body afresh. And Lord, he also worshiped you and praised you. God, I praise your name. I thank you and take your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.